Hi, welcome back to another Terranscapes cocktails and comments video. We'll start with the cocktail and the cocktail of the day. Uh, it's daytime. I have a party to go to a little bit later, so we'll call this pre-party, uh, pre-party prep or pre-pro. Uh, this is a Mary Pickford. Uh, Mary Pickford is an ounce of rum, an ounce of unsweetened pineapple juice, a quarter teaspoon of grenadine, a quarter teaspoon of maraschino liqueur, and a maraschino cherry as a garnish, which is now sitting in the very crux of my glass. So, well, let's give it a taste. It's very tasty. It's actually kind of refreshing. It's a little cloying, of course, with all that sweet added to it. Um, and I wish it was just a little less cloying, but that's personal taste. I love pineapple juice and rum. You can't go wrong with that combo. You could just, if that's all you have in your cabinet, you've got a great cocktail. It's not too grenadine, which would be a little sickly sweet, you know? Hmm. And um, of course, you know, looking at the glass, it's a very attractive cocktail, but uh, some people might consider this perhaps a ladies cocktail. I think we should eschew any such uh, gender uh, placements upon cocktails uh, because I could see myself enjoying this out. This glass was given to me a while back by a viewer um, and I just wanna say I still enjoy it. If you're still watching, I love this glass. Sometimes people ask me, why do I, how do I pick a cocktail? And I usually just, uh, I thumb through the book and sometimes I, cats. I sometimes come across a uh, cocktail that's a classic, you know, like last week's Manhattan. And I'm like, oh God, well, I got to have a Manhattan because it's, you know, it's a classic. And this time I was kind of just thumbing through and these were cocktails that were uh, pre-prohibition era and were named for uh, movie stars of that time period. And so I was like, oh, I, you know, who's Mary Pickford? I should probably just check her out. A very, very interesting woman. So we're going to take a slight historical detour down to the 1910 through the uh, late 1930s. And I'd like to tell you a little about Mary Pickford because I was enthralled by her as I was reading. When Mary Pickford was acting uh, between, uh, say, 1910 and about 19, well, in the 1930s, uh, she was the most popular actress in the world. Uh, she was known as the girl with the golden locks and or queen of movies. And while this photo shows the locks not being quite so golden, uh, there was a big push in those eras uh, to bleach women's hair to become bombshells or, or superstars uh, and with some crazy results because the bleaching art wasn't really nailed down at that time period. Her curls were one of her mainstay known attributes and she really entered movies as a child actress and was known for playing a very, you know, uh, young, very innocent kind of role during the silent movie era. Uh, during World War I, she used her immense fame to uh, promote the sale of Liberty Bonds to fund the Americans in the war and did that alongside Charlie Chaplin as well as Douglas Fairbanks. And she was uh, remarkably successful in that, was considered a, a, a huge asset to the military in terms of generating funds. And the uh, Navy actually gave her, I can't remember what the title was, but they were very appreciative of that. But she was also a very astute businesswoman. And early in her career, she began to take over her career. This is a very rare thing in the movie industry at that time period. And so um, she actually began to move into the backdrop of movie making. So she was directing and producing her own films uh, around 1919. And, and in 1920, she produced uh, Pollyanna and Lord Fontenley, which she starred and produced in both, I think maybe directed as well. And each of those movies grossed over a million dollars. 
1919. So she was very successful. And in 1929, she won the Academy Award for Best Actress for her role in Coquette, uh, which was a speaking role. And that's noteworthy because uh, this was the time period when they were transitioning from silent films, where she had made her stardom, into talk films. And she was a bit uh, reticent about the transition, uh, not only for her own skills in performing in the talking environment, but she also believed that films as an art form uh, didn't need and shouldn't have uh, talking over it, you know. So uh, she was sort of a little late to the game with regards to that to movie production. And to just jump back one year before her 1920s uh, dual movie successes, uh, she actually founded United Artists Studio, along with Douglas Fairbanks and Charlie Chaplin. And so these were the three titans of movie industry at that time. And only Charlie Chaplin was above Mary Pickford, with um, Douglas Fairbanks being also known as the king of movies. And in 1920, when she made those two movies, that was the year she actually married Douglas Fair Fairbanks. I have trouble with his name. Uh, and Douglas, just as a side note, he struggled intensely with the transition from um, movies uh, that were silent to the talk era. And uh, his career, uh, really, it's a tragic story all to its own. And I think I will make a Douglas Fairbanks next week. And I'll talk a little bit more about him. Very interesting story as well. So we're going to set Douglas aside for a second, but just to note these three people who would have guessed, right? All coming together to do this. And they also were all together during the promotion of the Liberty Bonds during World War I. Now in 1934, she appeared in Star Night at the Coconut Grove, which was her only appearance in Technicolor, and Technicolor being relatively new at that time. And the, the Star Night at the Coconut Grove, so I spun off onto that, is a really interesting short film. It's 20 minutes long. I'll put the link in the description down below for you to go check it out. And I wish I could get a higher quality copy. Sometimes these old films, it's so hard to get something decent to look at. So you'll have to bear with it. But this movie is basically a, a meta Hollywood movie that's only about the promotion of all of its current stars in acting. So it's kind of like a roll call of all the big names from the 20s and the 30s, sprinkled in with um, dance numbers, there's a historical fashion show, um, there's uh, singing numbers, and one of the singing numbers is actually the one that she introduces, and she introduces Bing Cosby. And I know a little bit about Bing, I mean, the name is, is quite familiar, but uh, he goes in to sing a song, and it's it's wonderful. You should watch this film just to see Bing Cosby do this song. Uh, and there's a couple other noteworthy things. Another interesting note about that film is that there's a uh, musical number with dancing, blah, 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 about the conquest of, an, of a Southern Pacific island and the basically extermination or, or extirpation of the indigenous natives from the island. A product of its time period, no doubt. One interesting note is that when she is introducing Bing Cosby, she mentions that she's been doing uh, radio acting. And this is really indicative of her making a statement that she is just as uh, um, versatile in the era of talking movies as she was in the silent film. Uh, so it's a noteworthy little little tiny thing. She makes a nod to somebody in the back she's working with. Uh, so you could see there that she's like, I I'm still relevant. Don't worry about me. Even though she was a mogul, a titan behind the scenes of the movie industry. And you may be wondering if this is the same Coconut Grove of the infamous fire, and it is, actually. The Coconut Grove fire only took place eight years later and resulted in 409 deaths and numerous, numerous other casualties. And most people know the Coconut Grove uh, fire for the um, ushering in the era of improved building codes, namely uh, proper exits for buildings and, and lighting them with exit signs and everything because um, most of the people who died in the Coconut Grove uh, died by 
being crushed uh, as they were trying to escape through the few doors that were available. One was a revolving door. It doesn't work too well when everybody's pushing on it. And that uh, the, the only other exits, some of them were blocked, some of them were locked, uh, some of them were just not obvious for the people who were present at the time. And I'm going to put the link to the wiki page for the Coconut Grove Fire because it's fascinating to get a little more information on it. I've never really, you know, studied it or I can't call reading a wiki page studying it, but um, the the speed at which the fire spread is phenomenal. Like it it's it's breathtaking in a pun semi intended. It's, it's amazing. So um, you should go read that. And if you don't, it's just noteworthy for me to add that there was a busboy who was trying to. Um, uh, change a light bulb, and he used its lighter to see in the dark, and they believed initially that he had um, caught the palm fronds on fire nearby, and that's what started the fire. Interesting note, palm frond fires, not that unusual in the coconut grove, so people weren't worried. They were like, oh, we'll just throw some buckets of water on it. And it later, uh, based on you know, present day examination of the structure and how the fire spread and, and eyewitness accounts and all of that, uh, link it to the air conditioning system, which had shifted from Freon to a flammable, I can't remember, it's a methyl, I should have wrote it down, uh, it's a methyl something gas, which is flammable. So, uh, because Freon was being needed for the war effort, so there was a real short supply of that. Anyway, uh, Coconut Grove Fire, fascinating. Check it out. Only eight years earlier, there is Mary Pickford uh, as a cameo amongst a dozen other stars who are doing cameos. So now to leave on a higher note than, than that infamous fire, this also spun me off onto a memory of a Mary Melodies cartoon of Warner Brothers, Bugs Bunny kind of fame, where I thought they had placed it in the coconut grove. So I went, I found that, I'll put a link down there. It's high quality. And I was wrong because it's not um, the Coconut Grove uh, in that it is focusing on actor actors a little bit, and actresses, a little bit later on. Uh, so in the 30s and 40s, thereabouts, uh, some actors I recognized easily. Some I was like, who? But uh, definitely inspired by the Coconut Grove. And if this was an actual... Uh, event that they were parroting, um, then that is really a direct descendant of the uh, Coconut Grove um, Star Night, I should say, Star Night at the Coconut Grove movie. So here's to Mary Pickford, the American darling, the uh, wartime hero, the most famous actress in the world, and an incredible businesswoman. Uh, such an interesting storied life. Well worth you checking it out and well worth having a cocktail named after her. And that leads us to viewer comments. Asserta, and I believe at least one other uh, commenter, and I'm sorry if I missed your uh, name, uh, were asking me about how the front wheels of the carriage will turn to allow the vehicle to turn. Um, I I hadn't given that strong consideration because I figured they're on a differential axle so they can rotate independently to make the corner. However, um, because the, the, the extension wheel, that is the actual steering wheel. Physics be damned. That, that's how it runs. But I may need to reconsider that, but it does seem like the wheels might skid. Um, so one solution I might take up is putting gears on them, and then they could literally be driven with a differential gear by the operator to encourage it to turn. Um, and if I, because I don't want to put them on a rotating axle if I can. Uh, so uh, that's something I will be looking into. And thank you so much for mentioning it because it just gets me to re-examine it a little bit more. And that's why I love so much people commenting on the work that I'm doing. Okay, now. For making the styrene rims, wheels. I have a lot of comments on those. Um, and I was like, whoa, that that really sparked some interest. A 58KYM58 Kim, Kim uh, mentioned um, heating the styrene in an oven 
to get it to accept, you know, the form that I put it in. This was also commented by MHXI Stens, Mixastens, and um, Utubasaurus. They were both uh, mentioning that as well. One of the difficulties I have found with heating the styrene is that the temperature uh, window where it's not soft and where it begins to melt and deform is very narrow, um, at least by trying to heat it by hand. However, I did see tabletop spot, Eric, heat a piece of styrene and bend it over a circle. I was like, I, I got a little torch, a little hand torch like he had. I don't know. I have to practice. I wasn't able to do that easily. And so I thought, screw it. I'm just going to put it in the form. But putting it in the oven, uh, I still have to get it into the form to do that and once it's in there if it softens it's not going to expand say where that little piece doesn't quite you know when i was trying to bend it and there's like the very edge wants to stay straight that's not going to just move into the form on its own so i don't think that's a good solution um however another commenter and i'm sorry i didn't write down your name but your comment was impactful uh mentioned putting it in hot water and that will soften it, uh, you know, like boiling water. So I did a little test experiment and that works. Not bad. However, I can't get my hands in the hot water because <laughs> it's too hot. And as soon as you take it out, it begins to cool and it becomes rigid right away. He was mentioning using a form, heating that up with the styrene around it in the water and then taking that out and uh, drenching it in cold water and then um, having it stay that way. I think I might use that method without that form because all I need to do to encourage it a little easier into the mold is to, or the um, the jig, right? And I'm going to be cutting that out of hardboard using a hole saw. People ask me about that as well. Uh, so that will be the technique I'm least going to try. And I can bend it in the water, even holding the two ends out. And that will create a semicircle that I can then cut to and use that as the you know piece to bend in there and it will already be pre-bent considerably to help it fit in there so that's what i'm going to try uh, that was a fantastic idea so thank you very much i didn't think boiling water would be hot enough to melt the styrene or to soften it omivez uh, said why not um, cut c sections like you know draw a c in the styrene cut those out and then laminate them uh, that would be uh, pretty difficult because I don't uh, have the ability to cut those pre with precision. And so um, I'm not really interested in pursuing that because it's actually probably more difficult. There was another comment, and I don't have that person's name down either. There were a lot of comments about the wheels who was mentioning, why don't I have a laser cutter, um, cut them out, and then they would be perfect right from the get-go. I really am not interested in pursuing laser cutters um, because I, I guess uh, the struggle I had with the ELF project regarding working with that and it has nothing to do with the other side of that process. The uh, person I was working with was fantastic, uh, but it was just a lot of work and I felt like I could do it in a different way and I wanted to kind of do it old school, you know, like get that basic kind of practice down. So I'm not going to do um, laser cutting. And then um, Two Guns Painting uh, said that perhaps I could do a cross section of a tube, right? So have an existing tube that size, PVC, whatever, and then slice that off for the rim. Uh, I don't have anything quite like that. And I don't know if I could get a tube inch and a half in diameter with that thin of a profile. Uh, so I'm not going to pursue that. I want to I want to get it in there by hand. I think it'd be nice. And, and I think it's going to be much easier with the 0.015 strips and then do three layers of them, uh, laminating them inside. I think that's going to be strong. It's not going to be difficult. It's going to make a perfect circle. I feel very confident about that. So that's what's going to happen. All right. And I think that's all the comments. So uh, I want to thank you for joining me for this video. I much, much appreciate it always, even if that's grammatically incorrect. And uh, especially for those of you who come over to the comments and cocktails, cocktails and comments, because uh, most of my viewers do not. And so uh, I appreciate you taking the time to watch these videos. They're fun for me to make. And uh, even though I spent uh, too much time today researching Mary Pickford, it was fun 
and it was uh, rewarding and I was excited to share it with you. So I hope you enjoyed that segment as well. Uh, if you want to support these kinds of videos, you can go to Patreon and you can make a pledge there, monthly pledge. Any amount is fantastic. Um, if you don't like that kind of monthly system, I have a PayPal me link down below. You could use that for one time donation and a huge help would just be telling friends about the channel. Tell friends about this, this crazy guy who does cocktails and then tells you the history about them. This is not going to be a regular thing, but I will do it for Douglas Fairbanks and maybe Charlie Chaplin. So maybe we'll do a little, a little three series here on these guys and gals, uh, and gal. Anyway, I got to go. I got a party to go to. And if you're interested in seeing another comments and cocktail video, I cocktails and comments video, I hope you'll come back because you know that I will be back soon with another Terrence Gapes video.